If you don't mind me, look at her. She's over here. Good morning. Welcome to Ripley Presbyterian Church. Those of you gathered in this sacred setting, those of you worshiping with us in your sacred setting today, we're glad that this is the day our Lord has made. Let us worship him this day in joy and in gladness. Before we begin our worship time, let's share in announcements and any joys and concerns as we have our prayer list after we share in our announcements. Um, <clears throat> do want to mention that the Ripley Rotary, let me turn my mic on, the Ripley Rotary Coats for Kids uh, shared a busy day yesterday here on campus. I think, uh, who all was in here? Elizabeth and Jen and Mike Parker. Am I leaving anybody out from our church family that was here that day? What a great Turnout. I know Benton was here too. And Norris said he sent me an update. Uh, had a great day. I'm gonna touch on that in the sermon a little bit today too. But there'll be another Coach for Kids event on Saturday, December 4th, from 10 to 3 p.m. 3 p.m. right here on our campus at the Greg Center. So grateful for that ministry to our community, to the kids of Tip County. All righty, the. Uh, Mission emphasis for this month is the Tippa County Good Samaritan Center. Many of you have already begun contributing uh, to that mission goal. We will write one check at the community Thanksgiving service on November 21st. That's next Sunday. Yours truly will be preaching. I think that's a 5 p.m. service. Is that right? It may say it here. I just didn't, I didn't look closely enough. Um, yep, that'll be 5 p.m. next Sunday. Hope you can worship with us. Uh, we've collected $325 so far for that mission emphasis for this month. Um, let's see here. Our elder congregational meeting will also be next to Sunday. So we'll have a meeting immediately following worship for the purpose of electing elders to the class of 2024 and the one expired term uh, for 2022. So uh, be sure to show up next Sunday and show your support for the elder classes that will be going into office at the first of the year. I guess the first year, is that right? Or immediately the first year? Okay. Any other announcements that we want to share verbally today? Okay, let's uh, lift up our prayer concerns and joys at this time. If there are any updates or additions to our prayer list. Dave, we could add Rhonda and Kim Brown's mother, Rhonda's mother-in-law. Uh, she passed recently with the kids. And Rhonda asked that we get her on the Okay, Brenda, is that her name? Brenda Brown, uh, we believe that's right. Rhonda or Ken, correct us. Uh, we're praying for Ken's mom uh, having some kidney trouble. So we lift up our dear friends, uh, Rhonda, Ken, and Ty, and certainly grandmother Brenda in her prayers. Oh, and my mom, Ann Wilkinson, she uh, ended up having a stroke and she had a kidney stone extracted Thursday. And she's in quite a bit of pain, but she's doing much better. Praying for Ann Wigington, those of you that didn't hear, say it over the microphone, had a kidney stone removed Thursday and lifting up she and Hollis and the entire family. I know Lynn and Lisa, all hands on deck, everybody trying to jump in there and help out. Other prayer concerns today? Or joys or updates you want to share? Uh, some had asked for an update on Danny Wilbanks. Uh, his uh, health continues to deteriorate. We continue to lift up. Lots of yeah, yeah, they do. Family needs lots of prayers, and uh, Danny does too. So uh, just uh, every day going down more and more. So continue to be prayerful for them. Still battling brain cancer was, was his symptoms. 
Okay. Are there other updates this morning? Oh, yeah. I forgot about that guy. Our son, Luke Hill, has flu. It's running through the campus and the Kappa Sig house, most specifically at Ole Miss. So we got him uh, fully medicated and trying to get better. And uh, has the flu hit us in Tippa County yet, Doc? Are we seeing it? So uh, we lift up Luke and some of his other friends who it seems to be early this year. That does. So, all right. Are there others? It's so good to see you. Good to be worshiping with you. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made once again. Let us worship God now in joy and in gladness. Amen. Beautiful prelude there. What wondrous love is this? And that's what we're gathered to celebrate this day. The wondrous love of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we meditate upon the goodness of God, let us share in our call to worship from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Friends, let's respond to that call to worship our God 
by praying together a prayer of confession. Would you pray with me? We confess that we have sacrificed your goodness for material goods. We have meditated on our problems instead of meditating on your promises. We have shunned your faithful love by seeking solace in sinful places. We humbly seek your mercy, O Lord. Please forgive our rebellion and ignorance, our wayward hearts and loose tongues. Restore us, O Lord, to the joy of your salvation and make us willing to obey you. Amen. Hear these words of your forgiveness. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God who did not withhold the beloved son, but gave him up for all of us. Will God not also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's share together now in a hymn of praise, number 306. This morning's first reading comes from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, beginning in the fourth verse. 
If you'd like to follow along, it's in your pew Bible, starting on page 244. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Then Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. For I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Oh God, as we bow in your presence, yearning and seeking, eager and hungering to be molded more in your image, to be strengthened for our journey in life. We ask that now, O Holy Spirit, you grace us with your presence. Even as we reflect upon the goodness of your holy word, we need your help to understand, to receive it, and to follow your guidance for our lives. So we pour out our hearts, O oh God, asking that you illuminate us, that you light the path for us to follow, to give us a vision for our lives and ministry, our family, our careers, our church, our community, this congregation. Help us, O oh God, to be molded in your ways, to provoke in the words of your scripture, your love and good deeds to the world around us, that you may be glorified. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. The second lesson from our scriptures today is from the uh, epistle writing to the Hebrews. If you'd like to follow along, that reading will begin at on page 224 of your pew Bible. We'll read verses 11 through 4. Excuse me, 11 through 14. That'd be hard to do, 11 through 4. We could read them backwards if we needed to, but... We're going to start with chapter 10 of Hebrews, 11 through 14, and then continue from verses 19 through 25. Listen with me for the word of the Lord. Any, excuse me, and every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, 
he sat down at the right hand of God. And since then has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And from verse 19. Therefore, my friends, since we have, been, have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil consciousness and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. I visited with a friend this week, had an evening meal with one of our friends, and he was telling me, he said, recently I'd gone to the dentist, and they put in a filling, and he said, now, when I put this in, you pay me one time, and the work is good. So if you have to come back, it's on me. Don't worry about it. Just come back if the feeling comes out or if it, it, it's not feeling just right. Come back and we'll make the correction. Well, you know, here's the deal. I've had one feeling in my life. One feeling, Tommy Covington. It was done 40 years ago, and guess what? That baby is still in there holding tight. You know why? Because Dr. Clarence Stanford did it right the first time. How about that? When we do it right the first time, it doesn't have to be redone. Now that feeling's probably gonna fall out this afternoon now that I've gotten cocky about it, right? But if it's done right the first time, we don't have to go back and redo it. Don't forget that, Noah, when you start putting those fillings in. In our scripture, at the very beginning of this theological reflection that we suppose comes from the Apostle Paul to the church in Hebrews, he says this, that Christ gave himself as a one-time sacrifice for all who trust in him. In other words, far greater than a master dentist. Jesus Christ did it right the first time. He only had to do it once. And the gift of his sacrifice, his life and love was complete for all who put hope in him. That's the promise of this text. Hebrews said we can be confident, Elizabeth, in our hope in Christ because the one who sacrificed for us is faith did it once and for all. Our scripture says that, and we reflect on this in the Psalms too, that after his sacrifice, Jesus went into heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. You know what that reminds me of? It tells us this, that these ancient priests, those who worked in the temple, as Jennifer shared with us today in that Old Testament reading from 1 Samuel, they would stand in the temple. They would offer those sacrifices day by day, every day, but never truly conquer the sinfulness of those that they served. Why? Because they had to go back again and again. You see the transition in our text today? What Paul says in Hebrews Jesus doesn't stand every day offering the sacrifice. He gave it once and for all. And then what did he do? He sat down because his work was finished. Friends, people hurting, 
those in need of grace and comfort and hope for a broken word world hear this good news Jesus work for you is finished your salvation the work is secure through the grace and life giving love of our Lord he did it right the first time you know, I talked about my friend, Dr. Clarence Stanford, so I've got to talk about my friend, Norris Howell, too, right? If I'm going to talk about dentistry. You see, when Dr. Stanford left this earth prematurely and early in life, he, he left a commission upon others to serve this community, right? People like Norris Howell and John Stanford and others had to pick up and continue the work that he was not here to do anymore. In a far greater way. I think that's what the writer in Hebrews is saying to us today. As he begins this story by telling us of Jesus' sacrificial love, abundant love. He says, now we need to pick up the mantle. We need to... Follow in his wake, but what could work because his work is finished. If Jesus is finished working, who's going to do the work now if it not be his church, his children, his people? Those dentists that serve our communion and the community in the shadow of Clarence Stanford, we, dear friends, serve this community in the shadow of Jesus Christ as his church. So how do folks like good believers at Ripley Presbyterian serve? My friend Norris Howell and others are hands and feet to this community in one way is through our Coats for Kids ministry that we share in partnership with the Ripley Rotary. Norris sent me a text last night. I think it was about 11.30 he texted me, Mike Parker. He had texted me earlier, but... Then he did later, and he said, we gave away several hundred, I think maybe 400 coats, was that it, yesterday? 800 coats have been given already this fall to kids in our community. Mike Parker was here yesterday. Benton, Elizabeth, Jennifer, I've started naming names. I know I'm going to get in trouble. Wave at me right quick if you're in this setting, and I didn't say your name, and those of you joining us virtually. Gave away several hundred coats, have given away 800, and what did we get out of this deal? Ripley Presbyterian, what did we get out of it? Gave them? We, we're letting them use our building, no charge at all. Our Greg Center, we're partnering in ministry, Ripley Rotary. And what are we getting out of it? We could be charging rent, couldn't we, Tommy? We need to get some money out of this or something. No. You believers at Ripley Presbyterian Church, are silly enough about your faith that you really apply what Paul is saying here today. How can we sacrifice for the sake of our community and embrace love and in the words of Paul, good deeds so that others will see Christ in us. We got a far greater gift, didn't we, Mike? By being able to serve and sacrifice beyond ourselves, we find the blessing and the joy of our faith. Hallelujah. Thank you for serving, for embodying what Paul says here today. I love the way he words it in verse 24. Listen to it again. He says, let us, as the church, let us, those who stand in the shadow of Jesus, whose earthly work is finished, he says this, church, let us us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. Let's unpack that a little bit. What's Paul saying? One of the first things I think he's saying to us is love is what the faith is about. Good deeds, Lynn, is how we change the world more in the image of Christ. Through love, not Hate, as the Proverbs writer would say, hate tears down, love builds up. That is the hope for our world. In its brokenness, in its division, in its corruptness, 
We need more Jesus and more of his love. Paul says, how do we provoke that? How do we live out love and good deeds? So may we consider that daily. How do we be Christ in our community, in our church, in our family? How do we live love? But another thought that I want us to remember today is why love? Why is it so important and central to our faith? You know, I thought this morning, Kenny, at a trip that he and I and Dad and several others, Benton's made some of those trips and Robert's hiking trips we used to make as co-workers. And once we went to Mount Whitney, we hiked. I have to say, careful to say hike. We don't want to say we climbed it because people think we're using ropes and picks and all that stuff. Hike to the highest point, Vince, in the continental USA, 14,000, almost 500 foot. And, you know, in training for that hike, we would go hours and hours and just walk and just be worn out. And, you know, the very worst thing, you know if you want to really get shut down if you're on a long hiking trip, trip is if you get a little pebble about a quarter the size of your pinky nail in your shoe that'll shut you down in fact it's so important that you don't get one of those little tiny pebbles in your shoe they make something called gaiters that'll go over your shoes to keep rocks and pebbles out of your shoe how can something so small be so powerful well, friends, if something negative like a small pebble can have that effect, how much greater? How much greater can one small act of love have upon the world around us? You see, that's why Paul is saying, as we have received the sacrifice and gift of glory, Lamont, from Jesus Christ, may we live in his shadow and give that one small act of love every day that is more powerful than any pebble or any hate and conquers every fear that we face. May we consider how we can provoke love and good deeds in the world around us. Paul also says, I've got to check my time. I've got rolling here. I may be going overtime, Lamont. My daddy told me once, said nobody's soul's ever been saved after 12 o'clock, so don't go too long. So. We still got 56 minutes, though, so we, I can preach on, can't I, Kenny? Verse 25, Paul says this. One of my favorite passages, multiple ways to interpret this verse, as it is with most scripture. But he says, let us not neglect to meet together, but continue encouraging one another. Well, the meet together, let's think about that a little bit. He's, he's saying, I think, a commission to us to be the church in community. To worship together. To be Christ to each other in our journey. In other words, as Lynn and I have talked about at times, sometimes you just got to show up. And oftentimes it's in our showing up that says more than our words can. Right, Sharon? Those friends and loved ones that were there for you and Robert and your family and your grief. Beyond their words, just their presence and your loss said we love you, and we're with you. There is power in our presence. Let us not neglect, as Paul says, to journey with each other, to share with one another. And Paul says this. I love these words. May we encourage one another. See, friends, as I... Hear this text today, Jason, where I think about that one-time gift and sacrifice of the great high priest of glory. As Paul says to us, now what are we going to do? His work is finished. How are we going to work? He says, may we love. May we perform good deeds 
And may we do this, church. It's not Jody saying it. It's Holy Scripture. May we encourage one another. Hear that. Friends, we live in a world where there's a lot of discouragement. Talking heads. Arguments on Facebook, Twitter, social media, Fox News, CNN. Everybody wants to beat down the other. And Paul says the way of life and love of Christ is to encourage and live out of love. It's a guy who wrote a children's story once called Clifford the Big Red Dog. Do y'all ever read that in English class, Jennifer? That's not high hat enough for 11th graders, I know. Clifford the Big Red Dog. We used to read about Clifford some, didn't we, Manu, with our boys. And the creator, the founder, the author of Clifford the Red Dog, Big Red Dog, he's no longer among the living, but when he was, every fan letter that he received, he'd write a handwritten note back to the child, Elizabeth. Handwritten note back to the child. He said, if a kid takes time enough to write me, they deserve a personal, intimate response. He believed in encouragement. Do you know, I think another reason, Shirley, he believed in encouragement was this. Before Clifford, the big red dog, made it to the big time, he was rejected by 15 different publishers. He knew what it was to be discouraged. So he knew the importance and power of encouragement for those around him. Friends, Paul was commissioned by Christ to be the evangelist and missionary of our faith because he understood profoundly the power of love, good deeds, and encouragement to transform the world more in the image of Christ whose shadow we seek to serve. This week we honored our veterans. We honored our veterans, and I'm grateful today for those of you in this setting and joining us virtually who served, who gave of yourself, who contributed to our freedom and our way of life, and your sacrifice made that possible. Thank you. We gathered at the park on Thursday. I did, Mom and Dad, and Several hundred others, Benton and Elizabeth, were there to commemorate and remember. John was there to give thanks for those who sacrificed, protected our freedom and our liberty as a nation. And you know, I got to thinking about that this morning. Many of us who were there, we were there not because we'd served. But we showed up, Elizabeth, for those we loved who had served on our behalf. The John Harrells, the Elton Wilbankses, Elvin Huddlestons, the, the Hollis Wiggingtons, those who sacrificed so we may stand in the shadow of that flag of liberty, taste freedom. As a nation, you see, when we show up, sometimes our presence says more than our words ever can. Friend, if that's the impact we can have as a nation, what can we have as the church? When we embody Paul's words to not neglect, to come together in worship, in encouragement, and share one another's burdens, celebrate each other's joys so that we may be Christ light and love that conquers all darkness and hate, even now and until he returns. Amen. I ask you now to 
pray with me as we lift up the prayers of God's people. Oh Lord, we bow in your presence grateful for this gift of prayer and worship that we share together one another's burdens. We lift up the concerns of the community of faith. We pray for every person who's worshiping with us right now, friends and family, those that are near and dear to us in our hearts, those worries that we all have or those illnesses or brokennesses that we face. May you bring healing and wholeness and restoration, whether the need be spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, or relational. You, O oh God, are the physician. We pray for our church. We thank you that we can be part of your light and love in this community. That we can live out our faith in a way that shares you with those around us. We pray not only for our congregation or even our denomination of faith, but wherever your gospel is practiced and proclaimed, will you inspire and empower your people in ministry? Will you help us, O oh God? Will you provoke us, in the words of Paul, to live out love and good deeds, encourage those around us? Since you've sat down at the right hand of heaven, may we stand up and be you to a world in need. We pray for our nation. Will you bring healing to this land? Will you help us in the words of Second Chronicles to humble ourselves, to seek your face, to pray and ask you to bring healing? We pray for our president. We lift up our Senate. We pray for our Congress, the Supreme Court. We thank you for those who've served our country as veterans and continue to serve. May we guard our freedom and be a light of service to the world around us. Even as you've sacrificed for us, Christ, as the great high priest, may we sacrifice and give of ourselves for those around us. We pray for every person on our prayer list, those that we've mentioned and whose names go unspoken. We Pray especially for Ann today and Luke, the names who've been mentioned personally during our worship time. We ask for healing and wholeness for each of them. We ask you to comfort those who grieve, those who are facing death. We ask you to give life and hope to those who are having spiritual, emotional battles. God, we pray for ourselves right now, Lord, as we all bow together and for one another. Will you bring healing and wholeness into our life? Even as you forgive us and restore us through your grace and sacrifice once and for all, may you make us more like you, Jesus, as we serve this world through your love and for your glory. And now, with the confidence of knowing and believing that we are your children. We hear the prayers, O oh God, you taught us to pray, Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you stand with me, friends, in response to our message today in reflection upon Holy Scripture and remember and affirm what it is that we believe about our God. Would you say it with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to go forth, thank you for worshiping with us. Debbie, I see you online. Debbie Falake and all you others, thank you for joining us virtually. May we go forth now with God's blessing to be light and love to the world around us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance, his gaze upon you and give you peace now and forever. Tommy Cubby.